Um, right. There was some talk today, I don't know if you saw it, um, about possibly shortening the preseason as a way to more gradually ramp up to the regular season. I uh, just wondering your thoughts on that, you know, what, what the players' stance on that is as far as sort of getting back to, into the swing of things uh, when you assemble in, in July. Uh, I think it's a mixed bag because you want you want younger guys to to get a a good opportunity to go out there and and get some real preseason action and not you know have their first you know NFL reps be live bullets um, and really count and so uh, but there there's also a safety aspect of understanding that there there was not OTAs there's no mini camp and with everything closed, you have to go under the assumption that they didn't have adequate tr- training facilities. Um, since most places were closed, you know, obviously guys are going to be pros and going to find ways to get it done. Uh, but it's not reasonable to, to expect them to be training at facilities at the level that you would need to compete at the NFL level. So there will be a, a, a ramp up period. Um, we're still in discussions about that. Um, but I have no real problems with us, you know, having limited preseason games. You know, obviously, um, I don't play a ton in them um, as is. And, uh, but there is, there is some, some of us who, who, who need to go out there and, and, and get some reps before the real thing happens. Richard, this is Matt Mayoko. Looking back at 2016 and 2017 and the protests then compared to what's going on around the country now, do you see that that there's been a major change, and and what is your hope for what comes out of this? Hey Matt, um, yeah, I think I think it's I think it's gonna. I, I can't predict honestly because it's in a time since I've been around and I've been alive. I don't remember it being this strong of a of an impact, you know, and and it reaching this many people and this many people being being upset, emotional about it, um, because, it, you know, the way the world has been, it's been kind of, you know, even when in 2016, 2017, when those guys were making it about police brutality and just changing it and inequities that we live in as African-Americans, they found a way to, to dole down that message and, and to, to divert it and, and make it about something else, you know, in a way to avoid the conversation. And I think this time, it's too full fledged and most people are actually getting the messaging and seeing it firsthand. You know, nobody can turn their eyes away. Nobody can turn away from what they're seeing and any human with any, any true empathy in them for, for their fellow human being would feel that it's wrong. And, you know, that's why sometimes you, you sit there and to make the point to people who don't get it. If, if that was, you have to try to take yourself out of, seeing that as a random stranger and, and see that as one of your own, see that as one of your brothers, your sisters, your, your cousins, your mom, your dad. And then that feeling that, that he, that evokes should, should energize you to, to add yourself to the fight. And I think that's what, why I think this will, will, will last a lot longer and the impact will be greater. Richard, this is Chris Biederman from the Sacramento Bee. Um, I'm just curious as to your response from the NFL and, and Roger Goodell's video that came out last week. And, and what do you think the league needs to do going forward in order to reinforce that message and, and maybe not seem uh, like it's taking advantage of an opportunity? Um, you know, I think having some, some um, people of color represented in, in the general manager space, the front office space, um, obviously head coaches, um, that would, that would go a long way. Um, you know, they, they've tried their best to, to throw money behind it for a long time. Um, and and it, it takes more than that. It takes, it takes you, you literally calling out bigotry, um, and being, being, being motivated, not just letting it be a, a fad and fleeting, it's being consistent year in and year out um, that you're combating this issue and that this is a problem that needs to change. And not just this year, not just 2016, not just 2017, but, you know, Black Lives Matter, they have to matter forever. You know, they have to matter every year, every, you know, for, for most of us, we got to live it every day. And so people, so many people are talking about, Hey, I'm so tired of dealing with these politics and sports, man. I'm so, so tired of, of, of having to deal with these race issues. And it's like, how do you think black people feel? 
You know, you deal with it forever from the day you're born to the, the day you get put in the ground. And so, you know, it's up to everybody to, to, to kind of end this. Hey, Richard, it's Ann Killian with the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask you two questions. One is how, I mean, this feels like such a moment in time, but how do you keep it going? And, and especially because nobody knows when there's going to be games again. And, and there's a lot of energy, but there's a lot of athletes who are involved in, in the cause aren't playing right now. And there's maybe when there's some normalcy to the sports scene, maybe there people will get, you know, move off the cause and, and find, you know, they're, they're back in their regular lives. How, do, how, do, how does the momentum uh, continue? And, and then I have one more question. Okay, I think, I think the, the change is going to be policy. You know, I think the change is going to be when, when the people that, that are racist and are bigots and are, are a big part of the problem are uncomfortable being that way. When they're at home and they're being called out, when they're around their inner circle, when they're being called out and they're uncomfortable, when policy changes, when police policy isn't, Oh, in New York, stop and frisk every person of color. Police inner city, and, and try to find a find a reason and put these people in jail, and then in nice suburban neighborhoods, find a way to protect and keep these people safe. It should be to protect and serve everyone. And until you know, there's a policy change about about de-escalating situation, and not you know, hey. Hey, I'm just going to, you know, to brute force. And I think Hey Richard, I don't know if you can hear us, but you you've been breaking up here. Those conversations have been had and I don't think you know, the energy was so down because the guys are playing. You know, hello? We can hear hello. you better now. Yeah, you were choppy there for a while. Okay. Um, no, I, I, basically, I, I'm saying that I think guys will use their platforms. Even once the game resumes, they'll use their social media platforms. They'll use press conferences. They'll use the game day platform that we have to continue this messaging and continue to fight the good fight because it's a lifetime of living like this. Um, and guys, you know, hope that this can be the time that it changes. And my, my other question was, um, you know, Roger had his videotape and said a lot of things about Black Lives Matter, but it, it seems that some, a lot of the official response is missing um, something, and that's the name Colin Kaepernick. And I'm just wondering if you uh, have any thoughts about um, Colin's role in all this and how to maybe make him part of uh the the nfl movement again and and maybe even he'll find a role in the nfl again well that you, you know that's the thing the nfl is a pr machine and they know how to how to construe the messaging to get their point across and to, to appease and pacify the public without without overstepping what they consider their moral moral high ground um and, and stepping off of that that pedestal and that's the unfortunate part i i don't know you know and that's a question that that would be up to, to you asking Roger Goodell or these owners who haven't employed him. You know, I told you guys this before, we don't, we don't employ people. You know, I can want him to have a job and I can think he deserves a job as much as anybody. And everybody said it, you know, who, who said anything because he was a good player. He, he showed he could play in this league. He could play at the highest level. So he deserves a, a, a job. But in order to answer those questions, I had to be one of the, the decision makers who didn't give him a job. And I'm not that person, you know, and I think that until – those people are asked those difficult questions, we'll never get the answers. Hey, Richard, Nick Wagner, ESPN here. Uh, Kyle mentioned last week that you guys had a, a lot of conversations about what's going on in the world uh, during the week in, in your virtual meetings. What were some of your takeaways from those meetings, and uh, were they encouraging? Did, did you find some uh, positive things to take away from that? Oh, there are tons of positive to take away. It's, it's, it's great to just see how much they care, how much Kyle and John and, and Frog and this organization, Jed, um, care about these issues and you know a lot has been made about them throwing money at the issue but um, I think there's a lot more 
at the at the foundation um, foundational level that has been done by by not only our coaching staff but our players, um, our front office, our ownership to really make a difference and make a change in this world. And I think there was growth in that conversation. There were you know Robbie was there, um, Fred, a lot of the leadership was there and present in that meeting, and everybody gave an opinion. But um, but I think at the end of the day, I, I don't I don't see our team as the issue, you know, our team is a, is a bunch of guys who come from a ton of different places who get along very well, who don't, who don't see color lines that, like that, who don't, who don't treat each other that way. Um, and I think at the end of the day, it's about spreading that love and about spreading that impact. And I think it was powerful. Hey Richard, this is Cam Inman of the San Jose Mercury News. Uh, what are your health concerns getting back once everybody gets back together at camp? And then have, what have some of your teammates relayed to you as their player rep with concerns about that? Um, there hasn't been many people who have relayed any true concerns about health risk. Um, the, the, the concerns and the questions usually regard um, are in regards to coming back for when, when are we coming back? Do we come back for mini camp? What is the exact date? And all those things right now are really fluid. Um, you know, obviously the NFL put out the testing protocols that, that, you know, are going to be in place and, and obviously how we're going to maneuver going forward. But I think, you know, just like a lot of the experts, um, who've dealt with this novel virus and, and things have changed day by day. I think, you know, the NFL and the way they maneuver through this time will change day by day as science improves and as information and, and knowledge improves about, about the virus and about how to best combat it and stay safe. But, you know, at the end of the day, football is football, you know, and, and no matter how much you keep 90 guys away from each other, they'll, they'll run into each other. They'll, they'll play football at some point or another, and, you know, it'll be what it's going to be. Hey, uh, Richard, this is Eric Branch with uh, San Francisco Chronicle. Um, wanted to ask you about the Super Bowl and Sammy Watkins' catch. Um, what uh, – I just, you know, as far as that being a difficult loss, the way it came down and, and Sammy's catch, what was the aftermath of that um, like for you emotionally? And, and, you know, if it was difficult, you know, at what point were you able to say, okay, on to the next season? Uh, you know, it's football. You know, nobody's played a perfect game yet. It didn't, honestly, it didn't bother me much, period. You know, I, I went out there, I prepared the best I could. The guy made a good play. It is what it is. I gave up a 38-yard catch in, in the football game. You know, I gave up 60 yards in the game. I don't – I'm not going to sit there and beat myself up about it. Like, I didn't prepare hard. I, I didn't go out there and put my best foot forward. You know, you win some, you lose some. You live and fight another day. There you go. Hey, Richard. Uh, this is David Lombardi. How's it going? It's great. How are you? Doing well. Uh, Kyle mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago that in some of these virtual meetings, he feels that the team has gone over this stuff so many times that he feels the players can, can coach now, that they can run the meetings. I'm wondering, uh, you know, from your position as a team leader, if you've seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, cerebral development as far as playbook mastery from some of the younger guys because they have had extra time to really delve into that aspect of the game. Oh, for sure. For sure. There's been a, a ton of growth um, from guys and, and a ton of growth within the nuances of the defense and the nuances of, of coverage that, you know, I think they're, you, you kind of gloss over so many things because you're moving so fast. You just want to get to the next thing, get to the next thing, get to football and get to, to on the field stuff. Um, and I think that this time everybody having to step back and, and slow it down and take their time that guys are learning more and understanding more than they ever have. Hey, Richard, Marcus Thompson here. I got a question for you. Might have a little personal motive, but I was wondering, how are you handling what I presume is a whole lot of white people contacting you, seeing how you feel and checking on you and trying to have this conversation with you about how they could be better or, or whatever the case? Honestly, it, it hasn't been as many as, as, as other people. Honestly, it's only been a couple for me, but um, it's been simple. It's a lot of times those people aren't the problem, but they have friends, they have family who, who, who speak a certain way, who are, who are a bit bigoted. Uh, 
and and who who have the notion that that a certain people are inferior because of the color of their skin, and it is on those people to to in order for us to have true growth to combat that to to say hey to make those people uncomfortable with feeling that way because it's not true. We're all human beings at the end of the day, and a lot of times you know preconceived judgment is detriment to all. And so I talked to them about good job, Papa. Uh, I talked to them about about just having that growth and having those conversations, those difficult, uncomfortable conversations and making that, that, that helps more than anything. You know, this has been going on for, for 400 years and we're probably the only country who has such a, such a awful dark stain on their history that doesn't really want to talk about it. They don't want to put it in American history books. They don't want to, they don't want to explain it. So if, if in 400 years, people couldn't explain this and, and couldn't get the point through, I don't think I would be able to explain to them the depth of the pain and the inequity in a few few minutes or a few hours. So um, I try to keep it as simple as I can. Hey, Richard, it's uh, Josh Shibau from Associated Press. Um, obviously, we heard from Roger last week. How important is it that maybe some more of the owners speak out, whether it's Jerry Jones or some other owners who have been vocal on some of these issues that haven't really spoken out um, of late? And, and also, as a player, does it is it possible to cause – how do you avoid if some players want to protest one way and some a different way that, that it not cause division in the team? Well, I mean, it, it, it is what it is to each their own. You know, I mean, you try to do things unified as a team and, and football is the ultimate team sport. But I think there's a love and appreciation for, for your teammate and your fellow man that, that you, you understand that everybody has their own ways and, and ways of doing things and ways of coping and ways of, um, of I guess, living. You know, and, and and you leave them to that. You know, you can't – I can't tell anybody to, to talk like I talk, walk like I walk, maneuver like I maneuver, or protest how I protest or feel a certain way about a subject that I feel a certain way about unless I have that empathy and I have that that connection with them. And I think football, there's a lot of that. You know, people will empathize with one another and, and have that brotherhood, you know, even if they don't protest the same way. Hey, Richard, this is MJ uh, Acosta from the NFL Network. Good to see you. Good to see you. Or um, see black screen. Or hear me. Right. right. <laughs> um, it's been a really challenging few months and an even heavier last week and a half, especially for the black community. Um, have you been able to have discussions on mental health with your teammates or your friends? And, and how have you um, found to be able to, to, to keep your, your, your mental state and your emotional state right through all of this and still train and balance a family and all of that? Well, I think staying connected, you know, is a, is a big thing, you know, reaching out on a day in, day out basis to different people. And, you know, obviously video chat is a huge deal, you know, because it, even though you can't touch, it's not tangible, at least you feel like you're in the same room. You feel like you're in the same presence as your, your friends and as your teammates. So a lot of these, a lot of these apps, Zoom, House Party, uh, Microsoft Teams, um, have helped in that, that process. You know, we have date night every Wednesday night with, with some of my old teammates, and, and that's helped. Um, but it's difficult, you know, and it's, it, it's, it, I think to acknowledge that is to acknowledge just the human aspect of it, you know, and, and how vulnerable each of us is in, in that, you know, and how, how sensitive of a subject this is. I think that being vulnerable with each other and having in-depth conversations has, has kept us all sane because we know we're not in it alone.